the things that I love and hold dear to my heart. They're just my own. They're not mine at all. Jesus, only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Remember, Lord, I'm human, and humans we forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done. To deserve God's only Son, I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands. Yet He chose the road to Calvary to die in my place. Why He loved me, I just don't understand. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I should have been. Remember, Lord, I'm human and humans we forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm here. I've been, uh, last night I was very sick while I was preaching uh, with sinuses. I thought it was a flu, but it was sinuses, thank the Lord, and uh, still got some more leaves to get up, so I'm going to pray that uh, I can get through that, but uh, thank the Lord for health and strength to be in the house of God. Sometimes we take it for granted. And I was thinking about many, many of our friends that cannot possibly preach tonight because of uh, sickness, and here we are. 1 John chapter 5, blessed. I'm going to read verse 13 in review, and that's the only review we're going to have. We'll go to verse 14, 15. Is anybody too cool in here? You can turn up the heat if you want to on that first register. Uh, if you'd like to turn it up a little bit, thermostat committee, I can't control it. I'm always hot. I have a coat on, I got high blood pressure, uh, I preach hard, so you don't expect me to be cool, amen, but I like to have y'all fresh, but not frozen, okay, amen, so if you need to turn up the heat a little bit, uh, just turn it up a little bit right there, uh, we'll do it during prayer then. The Bible says, let's stay in all the word of God, that'll help you thaw out, it says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I show that to every person I lead to the Lord, every person, because of their assurance is in what is written and that they believed. Now look at verse 14 and 15. This is tremendous promises about how we can have our prayers answered, and that's what we need. If we ever need to learn a lesson, we need to learn how to pray. The Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, According to his will, we, that we desire of him. I said, we have the petition that we desire of him. If any man, excuse me. And this is the confidence we have in, in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. What a promise. You may be seated as we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. and We thank you, dear God, for the privilege of being in the house of God tonight. And we pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us to rightly divide the Word of God as we teach this lesson and preach this sermon on how to have our prayers answered. And Lord, this is critical 
There's so many people, God, that need us to pray for them. Lord, they're heartbroken. Uh, they're uh, in depression. They're out of the will of God. Uh, they're wasting their life. They're in sin. God, some are lost, and they're going to hell. And Lord, we want to pray for them, but we want to pray for them, uh, Lord, the kind of prayers that will be answered. And so, Lord, help us to learn how to pray tonight. And we're going to thank you and praise you from the youngest Christian to the oldest Christian in this room that we can uh, learn and re be reminded of how to have our prayers answered. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice in 1 John there's a theme of fellowship all through the book. And the theme is this. If you're in fellowship with God, there are some great blessings. I want you to notice, first of all, the confidence of our approach. The confidence of our approach. Uh, in 1 John 2, 28, the Bible says this. It says, And we know, little children, abide in him, that when ye shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so the first thing we've got to realize is that, folks, there ought to be some confidence, not cockiness, in the Christian life that we're right with God that we have everything right with God, that our testimony is beyond reproof, and that we're in the perfect will of God. And I'm going, to I'm going to teach you tonight on how to find the will of God, how to know the will of God, how to enjoy the will of God. Number A, uh, Brother um, uh, Joel, it says we have confidence in our access. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, if you want to write that verse down, it's one of the greatest verses on having access to God, is that we can have confidence that we can have our prayers answered and go into the very presence of God. It says, let us therefore come boldly, come boldly uh, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The Bible says come boldly, and that means that we have confidence that God invites us into his presence to ask some things that we can never do. Now, if you, don't, if you don't depend on prayer in God, you'll get what you can get out of life. You'll get what you can do. You can get what you can fix and what you can uh, uh, undo. And, and all it'll be is human effort. But if you pray, God says we have confidence of access. And then we have confidence in our asking. Back in our text, in 1 John chapter 5, in verse 14, 15, it says we have confidence that uh, we can have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. And so we need to be in will, the will of God. It's, ex, it's expedient and it's urgently uh, uh, expedient that we are in the will of God when we pray. If you're not in the will of God, you can have no confidence. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, and look at verse 20. The Bible says this in Ephesians 3, 20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And then here's the theme, and here's the, the uh, reason that we can have our prayers answered. Unto him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus, throughout all the ages, world without end. And I love this word, amen. And so, folks, the reason we pray is for the glory of God. And the, we have confidence when we ask something that God is able. There's not a prayer that God cannot answer. Now, I'm not saying there's not a prayer that he will not answer, but he can do anything, amen. He can do everything. He's a mighty God. And I want you to notice, second of all, the conditions of asking. The conditions of asking, thirdly. Uh, we see uh, the will of God. Uh, write it down in your heart. Maybe underline it, please, in your text. First John chapter 5, it says we have written, it says, that, it says that we ask anything according to His will. Underline those two words, circle it, highlight it, do something with it, but remember it, it's His will. You cannot dictate what God's going to answer. Uh, I don't like this uh, TV evangelism where they say, name it and claim it. No, what you need to do is let God name it, and then you claim it. Sometimes it's God's will 
for people to go home to heaven. I was talking to uh, Bubby's wife uh, a couple of days ago, and, and he said, I'm not sure we're doing the right thing keeping him on this machine. And we're having a team of doctors meet with us yesterday afternoon. They did it at 3.30, and then he'd only lasted two hours off the machine. And, you know, that's a decision a family has to make. But I want to tell you something, friend. The will of God, the will of God overrules everything. And the will of God is, is what we need to claim. Now, it guides, us what we, uh, it guides what we request from God. The Bible says in Matthew 6, look at it very closely, Matthew 6, verse 10. I'll try to take my time on this because it's, it's very urgent that you know that you're in the will of God. And anything out of the will of God, no matter what you think about it or what people say about it, if it's out of the will of God, you cannot have your prayers answered. Uh, the Bible says in uh, the great prayer of uh, the Lord's prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer, they said in, uh, uh, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, uh, as it is in heaven. Give us, day, day, uh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, that can't be the Lord's prayer because he never had to forgive. He was teaching them, the disciples. And it says, Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Now again, if you got an NIV, one of those funny Bibles, verse 13 is left out. It's totally left out of the NIV. Now folks, I know that cannot be a verse that should be left out because the only reason you ought to pray is for his kingdom and his power and his glory forever. How wicked that is to leave out that verse on that part of the, of the prayer. Folks, and I know it shouldn't be a prayer just recited. I learned that prayer before I was saved. But folks, it's a prayer that should definitely uh, be our heartbeat that we pray for his kingdom and his power and his glory. But back verse 10, thy will be done. Thy will be done. You got to go by God's will, not your will. Uh, your will will get you in trouble. Your will will waste your life. Your will will be futile and your will will be fatal as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. And then uh, it governs what we receive from God. Uh, Elijah and Jonah both prayed out of the will of God. Elijah prayed for death. He prayed for suicide. And Jonah prayed for death. And God did not answer those prayers. See, it wasn't the will of God for, for Elijah to die when he was discouraged. Even the great man Elijah said, I, I, I can't handle Jezebel. Well, he just handled 850 prophets of hell, and God did through him. And uh, the fire fell in, the, and in 1 Kings chapter 18. In 1 Kings 19, he's praying to die. It was not the will of God for him to die. And folks, the will of God sometimes is very hard to discern, and sometimes it's definitely hard to trace. You must trust the will of God. In Acts chapter 12, there's an unusual thing that takes place. James is killed. And Peter is released from prison and he's spared from death. Now, what makes the difference in Peter and James? One, one answer, the will of God. It was the will of God for James to be killed. But it wasn't the will of God for Peter to be killed. He was released from prison. So the will of God is the will of God. It's not the will of us. And it's not the will of convenience. And it's not the will of how we feel about it. And then let me go uh, fourthly and say the certainty of our answer. The certainty of our answer. There's the conditions. It's the will of God. Uh, but the certainty of the answer is the promise of answered prayer we know. Look at that verse. These, uh, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And as well as you know that you're saved, you can know that God will answer your prayers. Look at this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have, that we have the petition that we desire of him. And so it all hinges on according to his will. Uh, the um, procedure of answered prayer is this. Sometimes God directly and immediately answers. Sometimes he delays the answer. That's his business if he wants to wait. Maybe you're not ready for that answer. And aren't you glad that 
there's another uh, thing, there's another answer that you don't want to hear, but there's a different answer, it said, and the answer is no. I am so glad, and I preached this last night out of James chapter 4, and I don't think I preached much over 20 minutes. Jeremy said I didn't, but my wife said I did, but I don't know if I did or didn't. Uh, I lost track, but I tried to keep it down to 20 minutes. Jack Palumbo came all the way up there to that church just to see if I could preach 20 minutes. He said that was his motive. I said, well, you're out of the will of God just being here for the wrong motive, amen? Jack's smiling now as he's watching on the big screen TV at home. But I want to tell you something. I was glad to see every one of you, and I know the preacher was because we ought to pray for Believers Baptist Church. We ought to have a burden for other churches, not just pray for our own little church. Amen? We ought to pray for other churches. We ought to pray for churches around the world. We ought to pray for our missionaries. But folks, there's a different answer, and that answer is no. You know, God, Father knows best. As I said, when I was a kid and me and uh, Bubby used to watch this together. I'll, I'll never forget it. And me and Bubby used to get in a bunch of fights, and, and he became my best friend because every time we got into a fight, uh, he'd come to the house with a handful of candy, and he'd want to make up. That was bribery. I'd take the candy, and we'd be friends. Amen? And so, you know, I, I mean, I, that's why I was a fat kid, I guess, but I just ate candy all the time because we was always fighting and fussing and just being boys and tussling. But he'd all, I remember him always coming and saying, uh, here's some candy, Wayne, if you want to make up and still be friends. And I'd been his friend anyway, but I like the candy. But, uh, folks, there's a different answer. There's a different answer. No. Sometimes it's not God's will for you to be healed. It's God's will for you to go to heaven. Sometimes it's not God's will uh, for that miracle that you're praying for and praying for. But God knows best, and he's always on time, and he never, never, never will be you'll be disappointed if God gets the glory. See, sometimes God gets the glory through heartache more than he does good times. If, it's all, if it was left up to us, we'd all want happy times. Amen? Like Brother Dean Hamby says, we'd want happy bubbles all the time. Amen? We just want to be uh, rich and famous and have five kids and be happily ever married and, and have, a, uh, have just a wonderful life. Sometimes God sends people through difficult times and they can pray and pray and pray and what they need to pray for is thy will be done. And I'll tell you what God's will is. God's will is always that he be glorified. Always. That's his will. His will is that you draw upon his grace that's always sufficient. Now let's go on to number five. Prayer is a mighty instrument. I'm going to give you this quote. Not forgetting man's will done in heaven but for getting God's will done on earth. Robert Law said that. Prayer is a mighty instrument. I'll write that in front of your Bible. Not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. And then number six tonight, I'm trying to, I got so many slides, I want to uh, give uh, Brother Joel a, kind of a clue of where, where I'm at. I want you to see that we need to pray with the Lord's heart. I want you to go back to, I want you to go back to uh, chapter 3 of 1 John and look at verse 24. John, John, 1 John 3, 24. And he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. And so the Spirit of God abides in us, and we can know through the Spirit the will of God. The Spirit of God reveals the will of God. So, if you want to really pray, you must be full of His Spirit. I told this to this little church last night, and I'll say it to this one, is that if we had one request, one request, the prayer request, and we could have no other for our church, it ought to be that we'd be filled with the Spirit of God. Because if we're filled with the Spirit of God, He leads us in all the other requests. He checks us, He stays us, He stops the will of God. Uh, he stops those prayers that's out of the will of God. And so first of all, we need to know the Lord's loving by the Spirit. The Lord's loving by the Spirit. Look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. The Bible says this, For we, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, adoption means we're the firstborn son. Firstborn child, have all the rights of, of, of the blessings from the Father. And folks, we need to realize that God loves us. 
and he wants to answer our prayers. We need to know the Lord's love by his spirit. We need to know he loves us and he won't hurt us. He'll always help us. And no matter what we go through, it never changes the love of God. Then number two, we need to know the Lord's longing by the spirit. What does God long for? Now turn to James chapter 4 and and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, read a very strange uh, verse to a lot of people, but it shouldn't be strange. It's uh, just it's just uh, you need to understand the language. In James chapter four, I preached this last night, uh, twenty minute devotion. In James chapter four, and I want you to look at verse one through five. You need to know the Lord's longing. You need to know, you need to know the Lord's will. And the only person that really knows the Lord's will is the Spirit of God. Look at James chapter 4, verse 1. So from hence cometh wars and fighting among you. Uh, Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members. You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have, cannot attain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. One of the reasons you don't have your prayers answered is because you don't pray. But look at this. It says in verse 3, And you ask and receive not because... You ask to miss that you may consume it upon your lust. The number two reason we don't have our prayers answered is because we're praying for what we want. We have our grocery list. Uh, let me just say this bluntly. God's not Santa Claus, children. Amen? And you can have a list a mile long. I know when my grandchildren are at home, the first thing they do is they try to get a catalog out and they start circling everything. I told Addie last time she was here, I said, why don't you just circle the whole blooming book? I mean, just do the whole catalog. Just circle the whole thing. She said, that'd been a good idea, Pop. I want it all. Amen? And she was so cute. She was only about two then, and so we tried to give it all to her, you know, whatever she wanted. But um, look at verse 5. Do you think the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, a lot of people have trouble with the spirit lusting. But this lusting is a, uh, is a word of positive desire. The Holy Spirit positively desires to envy. What's he envying? He's, he's wanting you to, he wants you to glorify God and love God more than you love anything on this earth or anyone. And so the longing for the Spirit is God to be glorified. Uh, Zechariah 12.10 12, says that he's the Spirit of supplication. So he leads us in our prayers. Then we need to know the Lord's leading by the Spirit. In Romans 8, 26-28. The Spirit of God leads you in the will of God. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, that he intercedes. And so I'm just trying to drive home this point that by the Spirit of God, you can know the will of God. And if you know the will of God, then you can ask confidently, by faith, claim it, yes, and say, Lord, I know this is your will. For instance, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So it's God's will for somebody to be saved when you pray for them. So you ought to pray with confidence that they will be saved. And I think we insult God when we go to him and we literally don't believe God's going to answer the prayer. And he won't answer your prayer. He might answer somebody else's prayer. But the Bible says in Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. Ever been that way? Just knelt down and said, I don't know what to pray. I don't know if I need to pray that God would kill him or God will heal him, or God will kill him, or God will uh, restore our fellowship. Amen? And uh, I don't think you ought to ever pray for God to kill somebody. But look at this. It says, in, and it says, Also helpeth our firmness, for we know not what we ought to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That means you don't even know what to say. And that's not tongue-speaking prayer language. It said it cannot be uttered. An utterance is an utterance. So prayer tongues cannot be an utterance. And a lot of people say, well, I got prayer tongues. And I asked them often, I said, well, what did you pray for? He said, I don't know. I said, well, how can you give God the glory if you don't know what you prayed for? And I have a prayer list. I check it all. Last night I was praying for somebody that was being airlifted to a hospital in South Alabama. And the time they got to the hospital in South Alabama, there was nothing wrong with her. I believe God answered prayer. This morning I was praying fervently that uh, uh, Alex would find the problem with our, our, our bus. You said, well, you shouldn't pray for things like that. Our bus is very important, amen? I mean, and, uh, and, we're, and we're breaking the law by having 40 people on a 
24 passenger van. And I don't want to go to jail for no kid. But, uh, you know, and I said, please, God, help him. And he got on Google, found the forum, found out what was wrong, went there, went under the transmission, found a little wire that had a little slit in it, and they fixed it in about 10 minutes. Amen? It took them 45 minutes to get to the filling station. Amen? Because it wouldn't go over two miles an hour. Say amen, Rose, right there. And it's fixed. But I think God answered prayer. When I got to the station, Brother Gary says, I got about five or six more prayer requests. Go ahead and pray for those. Amen. You know, praise God. I was praying for a wire. Amen. Find the wire. Amen. And, you know, I believe God answered. You can say, you're crazy. That was just a good mechanic researching Google. You can find everything on Google. I want to tell you something. God's better than Google. Mark that one down. Say amen. Amen. And it meant a lot to me that God answered my little prayer because that little prayer help some kids get to church tonight and probably one of them will get saved and kept petty from quitting but anyway let's go on amen uh, we, we see that it says in verse 27 he that searcheth I wish you had heard that he that uh, I'm sure he'll hear it from the gossips on the back row but anyway it says he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God there it is he makes intercession for the saints in other words, folks, he shows you the will of God, but he shows you what God wants. And I want to tell you something. If you're spirit-filled, I mean nothing in your life blocking the flow, when you pray, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. He'll either amen or oh me, that prayer. He'll give you peace to keep praying it, or he'll change your prayer. Have you ever had that happen? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. He'll give you faith to claim it, or he'll give you faith to say, hey, I don't know what the will of God is. I'll just keep praying till you direct me on how to pray. Folks, I believe I'll be spirit-led most indeed, most importantly, in our prayer life. That's why it is a shame and disgrace to come to a prayer meeting in the flesh and have some secret sins in your life and come to this altar and beg God for our missionary safety and you've got something in your life where the Spirit of God cannot say amen. And folks, I don't want that. I think it's more important for me to be on praying ground than it is preaching ground. Because I have an obligation to pray for each one of you. And if I'm not on praying ground, I can't even be your pastor like I should. And so we must stay on praying ground. Is there anything in your life that's a step? In? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe it is, that you ought to abstain from even the appearance of evil. Come on now. And I'll tell you why that is. Because usually the appearance of evil leads to evil. You can't handle it. Say amen. You can't handle it. If, it. if it looks evil, it's probably close to it. You're sort of skirting it. Say amen. And I want to tell you something. Last time I checked, you back up close to the fire, you might just get burned. Especially if you have a long dress on or, or long sleeves on, you're going to get burned. Amen? Just go ahead. And I'm going to tell you this. You get close enough to the fire, your old buddies will push you in there. Bubby was kind of like that. He'd try to push me into the fire. I said, no, Bubby, we ain't going to do that. He was a wild driver, I'll tell you that. And it's the grace of God we survived our teenage years. Green uh, roadrunner. He thought it was the, he thought it was the uh, fastest car in Marietta, Georgia. And when I got in it, I said, if I ever get out of this car, I'll never ride in this car again. Amen. I'll just stick with my comet that wouldn't go over 45 miles an hour. Amen. Comet. God, help me. I don't know how in the world I ever got a date driving a comet. But anyway, uh, my wife was very, very patient. But anyway, I want you to notice this, friend. He searches the heart. And he knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus is our intercessor, but the Holy Spirit is God's intercessor. See, the Holy Spirit is the escort to heaven. He is the intercessor of heaven. He interprets for you what to pray. He goes into the throne room and says, hey, I don't think that's the will of God. He won't like that. God don't want that prayer. Hey, listen, stop praying for that, you know. And I want to tell you something, friend. I believe that we ought to agree with the Holy Ghost when we pray. Say so, amen. And listen, I wasn't raised uh, like most of my preacher friends are. Most of the Tri-State Preachers Fellowship, they pray all out loud, same time. I mean loud. Everybody, you know. 
I lose my place when I pray like that. I'm from South Georgia. We pray by course. Everybody prays once in a while. And I want to tell you something. Sometimes I think it's best to pray one at a time because if somebody's praying out of the will of God, I'm not agreeing with it. They might be praying my wife leaves me so they can marry her. And I'm going to say, no, Lord, that ain't the will of God. I ain't praying with that guy. Amen? But if we agree in prayer, we say amen, say amen. I'm not criticizing you if you pray all out loud at the same time. I don't care. But I want to tell you something, friend. You better pray with agreement, not with your brother and your sister, but you need to agree with the Holy Spirit when you come in the throne room. And if you've got sin in your life, you can't hear him. If you've got something in your life that's a stumbling block, you can't hear him. Your prayers will not be answered. And so we need to know the Lord's leading, and he is leading. We have special access by faith, by the Spirit of God. Then last but not least, God can work through your prayers only as he truly is Lord of your prayers. The Lordship is exercised entirely by the Holy Spirit. You cannot even call God, God Lord without the Spirit. You can't even say the name Lord really and mean it without the Spirit of God. Write down Ephesians 1, 15 through 21. We don't have time to get there. But praying with a confident heart. I want you to go back to 1 John. We'll try to close. 1 John chapter um, 3, not 5, 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our, I'll wait on you. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, you know, it's best to put a ribbon in the text because I'm going to go from one place to another usually on Wednesday night. I don't do that on Sunday morning. But on Wednesday we study a lot of Scripture. But look at this, 1 John chapter um, 3, verse 21. It says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. You know how you can have confidence in your prayer life? Make sure you're confidently sure that you're right with God. Look at verse 22. And whatsoever... We ask. That's just talking about don't be condemned with sin. Don't have things in your life that's borderline sin. Uh, have confidence that you're right with God. And then verse 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And do those things, here it is, that are pleasing in his sight. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So here's the condition for prayer. A lot of people think, man, this is a blank check. I'll get saved and I can pray anything I want to and God will answer it. No, the Bible says you can have confidence if, you have, if your conscience does not condemn you and that whatsoever you shall ask, uh, if you keep his commandments and you do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It didn't say just keep his commandments. It says you please God. Folks, you've got to live a life that pleases God and then you can have confidence to ask whatever you want, to ask and receive of him. And then you go back to our text and it's saying that you ask and have confidence when you know it's the will of God. So you know that you're in the will of God and you know it is the will of God, you can pray for the will of God to be done. The will of God is a mystery, but the will of God is so magnificent because God has given us his will. And I'll show you how you can find God's will in just a second. And so praying with a confident heart. Hebrews eleven six 6 says we ought to come to him believing that he is. And that he's rewarded them that diligently seek him. But you can diligently seek him all you want for something out of the will of God. And I'm going to tell you something. He won't answer it. The will of God is the word of God. And the will of God is led by the spirit of God. And so there's boldness in the approach and there's boldness in asking. Let me give you this quote by Wesley Duell, a great book on prevailing prayer. And uh, it's the next one, brother. It says, we listen to his voice, respond to his touch of power, and offer ourselves in total surrender to his active lordship so that we may indwell us, infill us, and pray through us. I want to repeat that. We listen to his voice. When's the last time you listened to when you prayed. Most of the time we're too busy with our list. We're too busy. And folks, I believe that every prayer ought to start with praise. And I believe we ought to pray and remember all the blessings He's already given us and that we're saved and that who He is and then start bringing our list out. 
And then by, by the time you keep praising him and you keep on uh, responding to his power and his touch and you're totally surrendered and he's Lord of your life, then he fills you and he prays through you. Folks, it's praying in the Spirit. Jude says, well, to pray in the Spirit. People have taken that way out of context and think it's some kind of spooky experience where you pray in some language that you don't even know what you're saying. And you can't give God the credit or the glory for answering the prayer because you don't know what you ask. You have not because you ask not. But you can ask and God will give you the, that answer of prayer. Let me give you another quote by Stuart Holden. It says, being filled with the Spirit is the only secret of real prayer life. Being filled with the Spirit of God is the only secret to a real Prayer life. Being filled with the Spirit. That means you're led by the Spirit. You're controlled by the Spirit. This Spirit-filled life is something else. Because the Spirit-filled life leads you into the prayer closet. And the Spirit of God not only leads you into a prayer closet, a place of prayer, but it leads you into the holies of holies. And you're actually in the presence of God. And you can be led in your prayer. And it can be humbling to see God work, and God will lay some things on your heart that you never thought he'd lay on your heart. He'll lay some people on your heart, and you'll call that person, and the exact time you was praying for them, they were going through a crisis, and God laid them on your heart. Don't tell me that's an accident or a coincidence. That's God, the Holy Spirit, giving you a prayer burden, leading you in prayer. This, this, This prayer thing is a spiritual thing. It's not some calculated recitation. That bugs me when people go through recitations. You know, people even hand out prayers. You know, uh, they, they tell you to pray these certain prayers when you got some kind of sin in your life. That's a bunch of baloney. You don't just have a recitation and you repeat it over and do it five times and you know, good night. There must be a spirit-led prayer. Let me just say how to know the will of God in closing. I've got about ten minutes. How to know the will of God. Number one, God's word reveals God's will. And that's called the general will of God. For instance, God has called all of us to be saved. You can know it's the will of God for you to be saved. If you're not saved, you're out of the will of God. You're missing the will of God. But I want to tell you something else. God's called all of us to be soul winners. That's the general will of God. And I want to just say this, friend, that's the light of the Word of God. So if you want to know the will of God, it's not spooky, it's not geographical, it's not, well, should I go to Africa or Afghanistan? No, it's, should you obey this Bible? And I believe this, you will not know the specific uh, personal will of God until you obey the revealed will of God. In other words, if you don't walk in the light God gives you, how in the world can He give you more light? Say amen. Amen. If I got in my car tonight and I said, I'm going to point it towards Chattanooga and I'm going to wait till the lights hit Chattanooga city limits before I move, I'd stay in that parking lot the rest of my life. And somebody would come and put me in the insane asylum in Millersville with my good friend down there, amen? And I'd be down there in Millersville, committed to uh, the mental institute if I did something like that. But you know what I do? I travel in the light that the, the car gives me. And I travel a little bit more. Last night I was doing the back roads to I don't know where we was at. And it was north of Alaska, I think. No, no, no offense, Brother Harold. You live just a mile from that church. And don't you get any ideas of going over there. But Because uh, uh, Brother Eddie will try to get you. But uh, I want to tell you this. Thank God. He's listening tonight. I know he is. Thank God, friend. I had to put it on bright. And I had to really trust what was beyond that crooked roads up there in Keith Valley, because I didn't know the roads. And my wife was in the back seat, and she was always saying, Honey, don't you think you're going a little fast? I said, No, I got it, I got it, I got it. Then I ran off the road about three times. I said, I better slow up a little bit. Amen, no, not really. And I traveled in the light that God gave me. And I want to tell you something, friend. God gives you light. That's the general will of God. And if you don't obey this, don't expect God to reveal the personal will of God. Then number two, God's spirit and prayer you have the secret will of God or the personal will of God. For instance, you ought to all be soul winners, but not all of you should be pastor of this church. Now, the will of God for is for me to be pastor. If y'all don't think it is, 75% vote will vote me out and I'm gone, even if I started the church. 
but I believe it's the will of God for me to be your pastor. Now, folks, I didn't get that by just saying, I'm going to show up and candidate. I did that because I first was a soul winner and a good follower and a faithful member because that was the revealed will of God. So I did what the Word said, and then as I did that and was faithful to, for the revealed will of God, God gave me the personal will of God. And I had a choice in the revealed will, and then I had the choice in the, in the personal will. Some people come into my office, I think the Lord's called me to be a missionary. And I said, well, where do you think you're going to go? He said, I think I'm going to Africa. One guy just walked in out of the street and said, going to Africa. I said, well, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you've attended church on Wednesday night? Well, I don't, I don't know. I said, well, let me ask you another question. When's the last time you won somebody to the Lord in Dalton, Georgia? And they said, well, it's been several years. I said, you can forget Africa. Until you do what God wants you to do across the street, God's not going to send you across the seas. And he didn't like that one bit. And he thought I was being arrogant. But I'm going to tell you something, I was being truthful with the guy. If you do not sweep the room God gives you, he's not going to give you another room to sweep. If you don't walk in the light God gives you, he's not going to give you any further light. And so a lot of people want to skip here and go over here and think there'll be an instant soul winner, an instant pastor, an instant teacher, an instant leader. I had recently somebody come to me and said, uh, I think God's called me to mission field. I said, well, build a Sunday school class then. I said, if you can't build a Sunday school class here, you won't build one over there. I said, you need to preach here, and God will use you over there. But before you do that, you need to do what God wants you to do right here. And I said, and we'll help you get there. And we'll push you that way. But I said, you've got to be faithful in the light that God's given you. And that helped him. And I've seen many a missionary get over there and they say, man, I don't know what to do. And I just have no confidence to do anything because I've never built anything. I've never won anybody to the Lord. I've never taught a lesson, never preached, never seen anything happen. And then they get over there and think it's going to be instant success. And they burn out and they're back home disgraced. So folks, listen. Submissiveness to the revealed will of God is the key. Let me close with Romans 12, 1 and 2. Y'all all memorized that when you was a child. It's a verse that every Christian ought to memorize. I advise everybody to memorize it. But folks, it's another thing to actualize it. It's another thing to live it. And I want to tell you something. This is how to know the will of God. Personally. Personally. Romans 12, 1. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Amen. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's the first thing. you got to present your body as a living sacrifice. And it says acceptable unto God, pleasing to God, for the glory of God, which is your reasonable service. You've been saved, you ought to serve. You ought to, you ought to surrender. You ought to sacrifice. But listen to this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here it is, real quick. If you do not renew your mind in the Word of God daily, and if you do not conform your life to Him and don't conform your life to the world, you'll never know the will of God. Because it says, And be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove means live it out. Prove means prove it. You know, prove me. If you tithe that God will pour out the windows of heaven, the Bible says, prove me now. Malachi chapter 3 says, If you'll tithe, God will bless you financially. That's what the Bible says. But folks, if you'll present your body a living dead thing, die to self, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, then you'll prove out the acceptable will of God. You know what that's saying? You will live such a life that you can pray and have so much confidence that God's going to answer that prayer. But a lot of times we, can, we want to give, we want to take out Romans 12, 1 and 2 and disclaim. I'll pray anything. Let me just give you this quote by R.A. Torrey, great man on prayer. It says, The secret of prevailing prayer is to study the Word of God 
and to find out what God's will is as revealed there in the promises. And simply take these promises, spread them out before God in prayer with absolute, unwavering expectation that He will do what He has promised in His Word. In other words, claim God's Word. You ought to pray Scripture. You ought to pray promises. That's why you ought to know promises. And folks, there's six keys to answer prayer, and I'll go over those next week. But it, folks, the first one's the one I want, to, I want to entice you to come back on. We need to pray in the name of Jesus. John 14, 13 says we ought to pray in the name of Jesus. And you know what I thought that was when I was a kid? I thought that meant I need to end every prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. And I did. I did it religiously. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. That's not what that means. That is words. Look at John 14, 13. Let me explain what it means to pray in Jesus' name. It says, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do. Now, folks, a name was very important in the Bible days, and it should be very important in your day. And folks, what it is, it means the name of Jesus means what glorifies his name. It means what, it means the character of Jesus. It means what would Jesus do? So if you're praying in Jesus' name, you're praying with his reputation at stake. In other words, you're saying in Jesus' name, I'm putting your name on this. I'm putting your name, some, you put my name on something, you better, you better uh, live it, praise God. You put Whitfield Baptist Church name on it, it's, a, it's an awesome thing to join this church because what you're saying is I associate my life with this church. I represent this church. But folks, more important than this church and more important than my name, when you get saved and when you pray, you ought to identify with his name, his character, his will, his word, and praise God. When you pray in Jesus' name, it means, Lord, I believe this is your will and I believe it will glorify your name. Because look at it. It says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But verse 13 says, well, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In other words, every prayer should be prayed to this end. Lord, that your name be magnified. That your name be amplified. That your name would be distributed around the world through this prayer. That people be saved because of the prayer answered. That people would know that you are God and you're a God of character and you're, and you're good and you're always good. That is what it means to pray in Jesus' name. We'll give you a few more next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message on prayer. I can't think of a more important subject for every one of us. God, because I want my prayers to be your prayers. And I want my prayers to glorify your, your name. And Lord, I, I, I was so touched last night with Brother Eddie's heartfelt burden for this church. Lord, only a few people showed up. But God, here was a pastor pouring his heart out for his church. And it touched my heart. It helped me to want to pray more for my church that you've entrusted me with, your church, Whitfield Baptist Church. And so, Lord, for your glory... And for your name's sake, God, I want everything in my prayer life to line up with your will and to glorify your name. And so, Lord, change our flippant prayers, change our fleshly prayers into God-glorifying prayers, and God, help us to pray thy will be done. And God, not just as some kind of little phrase to sum up everything we want to pray for, God, that we truly mean it and that we're truly yielded to it, and that you're truly Lord of our life. And then, Lord, you said that we could have the confidence to pray anything in your will, and you had answered it. So, Lord, there's a lot of people dependent on us, and we don't want to go through the words. We don't go through the motions. God, we truly want to pray for our children, our grandchildren. They're in harm's way right now. God, I pray, dear God, for people that have wasted their life, like my dear friend, 
Lord, just searching for the will of God and searching for peace. And God, I pray, dear Lord, that we could learn to pray better for our friends, better for our families, and that God, you would answer according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, this is a word of invitation. And we say, Preacher, I really want my prayer life to count because there's some people that I know that are in desperate need of God's help, God's grace. And I pray that God would use my prayer life to touch their life. Is your prayer tonight. Would you slip your hand up on their behalf all over this place? First thing the Spirit of God will do is put you second, put others first, and put God above all that. Father, use this message. Thank you, God, for speaking to my heart about God glorifying praying and praying in your will and praying with a yielded, sacrificial heart. God, help us to spend much time this week in praying for souls to be saved, for children to come back to the will of God, people to get help that are so discouraged by being sick so much. I think about Brother Howard. He had been sick a day in his life until this struck him down several months ago. God, it seems like it's endless. God, please be with our brother. Help him, encourage him. God, for your will and your glory, I pray you'd raise him up once again. Lord, if it's your will, I pray you'd give him more, many more years to serve God through this church. Because we sure love him and sure need him. So, Lord, help us to learn to pray. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name.